What's cracking, guys? Omar Esoff here, back with another video. This is actually a podcast, a podcast from Iron Culture that I started with myself and Eric Helms. The idea behind Iron Culture is to explore the social, historical, cultural, as well as scientific perspective as it relates to lifting. This is an interesting uh, episode because we have both Jeff Nippert and Greg Knuckles. For those that don't know, they're two evidence-based practitioners. Greg writes lengthy articles all about getting stronger. It's a very popular his website, Stronger by Science. He basically has gone completely counter to the common narrative you see in the fitness industry, which is you want to keep it short, brevity is key, and you want to, you know, dazzle an individual. So one weird trick in order to lose weight. He does the exact opposite. He'll write 10,000 word articles and they'll do very well, all about how to squat more, deadlift, get stronger, muscle mass, a variety of different topics. Uh, Jeff, uh, by the same token on YouTube has done something similar where he's gone even more in depth when it comes to certain topics, building muscle, uh, you know, a technique, form, nutrition, more than you would think on YouTube would succeed. And once again, if we take a look at the landscape on YouTube, we'll tend to see a lot of advertisements, a lot of people maybe vlogging about themselves, which is totally fine, bodybuilders talking about lifting, and that's cool, but if you want something practical, useful, tangible that you can use in your next session, you want to turn to individuals like these. And I know a lot of people watching this video or my videos in general, they either want to be a trainer, maybe you're just an IG lifter where you want to grow your following, or maybe you have aspirations one day of starting a YouTube channel, hopefully helping people out and provi uh, you know, providing informative content. If that is your goal, you are basically have this opportunity right now to learn from two of the best in uh, Jeff and Greg Knuckles. Learn how to be successful on YouTube, on social media, while doing it the right way, and that's what I want to emphasize. So it's a two-hour podcast because we cover a hell of a lot of topics. I will provide timestamps in the description. If you like this video, if you enjoy this podcast, consider checking out Iron Culture, the podcast. We have our own separate YouTube channel. It's available on iTunes, Spotify. Make sure to check it out. Link to that is in the description. New episode every single week. This is where I provide more complex, more advanced information where we had a fantastic episode all about carbohydrates, uh, the ketogenic diet, as well as the carnivore diet. We had another one on periodization with someone called John Kiley, who basically uh, pioneered modern periodization. Some really good episodes. Anyways, all that's linked in the description. Let's get this episode started. How to grow a social media following while keeping a scientific perspective. Wow. Welcome to another episode. Hi, Greg. I recognize you. <laughs> another episode of Iron Culture Podcast. This is a big one. This is a big one because we have a couple of smart boys in the same room talking about what they love. Lifting. We do. I think, I think lifting. That's what I was going to say. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I. That's not where I go when I think of boys in a room talking about what they love, but my, maybe my brain's just somewhere else right now. Contest prep. It gets to everyone. Uh, I was going to say that's... maybe uh, for, you know, Greg, it could be Hamilton. Um, it could be I bonded first. We got uh, two powerhouses here. We have Greg Knuckles and uh, Jeff Nipper talking today about science communicators, but essentially transcending expectations placed on social media individuals where before, I would say in the last several years, there was the expectation in order to become quote unquote popular, either with blogging, YouTube, Instagram, you had to sell out. And what did sell out mean? Well, it meant extreme clickbait or maybe appealing to people's emotions rather than to information that would be useful. So you'll see people on YouTube all the time, uh, juicy thumbnails uh, talking about things that are not true. One weird trick to get abs and they'd get millions of views. And it's not, that's the way that you had to do it in order to become popular. But then someone like Jeff rolls around that has more information than ever before, more detailed information, concise, useful, understandable, and he grows probably the fastest out of any uh, fitness YouTuber over the last several years doing it the right way. Greg Knuckles, who I know we bonded over our mutual love of peanut butter, depth jumps, and almost getting wrapped though that time we did the lifting lights, you know. Um, we did like 20, 20 sets of bench press, Greg, and we're done. Yeah, I I, uh, I think it's really cool what you've both done. It's really awesome to have you both here. I also have a bit of background with, with both of these gentlemen. I met uh, Mr. Nippard at his uh, pro win back in, I think that was, what, 2013? Yeah. Was that 24, right? 2014. 2014 yeah. is when you won yeah. the Muscle Mayhem, and we got to talk at our little uh, get-together afterwards. 
Yeah. And uh, cool. it was a privilege to work with you as you did your pro debut. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, always cool to work with a, an intelligent, gifted athlete. Um, and then I think shortly after that, I first start, started talking to Greg. I think we started arguing on Facebook about uh, D-training was where it started. And that would uh, then evolve into us eventually starting this crazy journey of mass. I, I, th I think it actually started with you giving me advice about grad school. It, yes, that's true. I I wasn't <laughs> going to to I was going to lie and say that wasn't the first time we talked um, because because of things that 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 that, uh, that we don't need to necessarily include. Yeah, and uh, we'll 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 leave it there. I, we'll I just wanted to I just wanted to correct the record, but then redact the rest. <laughs> right. So we have a we have a corrected redacted record. Now this is like the area 51 of the start of our relationship. Um, so I love it. But I, I think just like Jeff kind of blew up the expectations of how you could grow on YouTube, he's not just calling people out or doing one weird trick or all that. I think Greg really just, man, shocked me as someone who's been trying to do this thing since 09 as I sort of first started writing uh, blog articles. And those, for those who are following on video, you just got a great insight into the mind of Greg Knuckles there. <laughs> oh, um, we're, we're doing video as well? <laughs> oh, we got both, baby. <laughs> and that is staying in. That's staying in. And we can do a clean start in. if you want, Greg, because I care about your reputation. No, it's, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, and, and that's actually I, I, not I was, true. I was just trying, th trying to throw Eric off. Yeah. Oh, you now, now you're thrown off. See the inversion there. That's so, fine. Uh, so yeah, Greg, so, so as someone who has tried my whole career to, to make complex stuff be digestible by others, um, and thinking that the pathway to that was being more concise, writing shorter articles, limiting jargon, Greg has done that, but yet also gone even more in depth and more complex and has some of the longer articles you'll see. And then paradoxically, in my limited foolish mind, uh, had his website become one of the most read blog sites uh, in the kind of lifting uh, intellectual sphere. So it's just our privilege to have these two people who are better versions of myself and Omar on our podcast today. I, I feel deeply uncomfortable uh, acknowledging that descriptor, but uh, thank you for having me on. Uh, my pleasure to have you uncomfortable. No. Well, they're just facts, right, Greg? I mean, like, if you are leading in that space, then you are, right? The numbers don't I, lie. I mean, the, you're, the data you're not, doesn't you're not lie, wrong. right? Yeah. <laughs> well, well yeah. If, if I can like just say like on Greg's behalf, I think it's really interesting that Greg has managed to do this not only because of the long form content, but also like I think there's this impression that blogs are kind of like on the way out as like written mm. form blogs are s sort of a thing of the past, but yet yours is still going super strong. Craig, so I think it's doubly impressive in that sense. I, I could be wrong because I feel so far removed from that space anyway, but it, to me as a YouTuber, it just seems like if I was to advise someone on how to make it now, I would probably say YouTube, Instagram, but you've clearly run counter to that. Yeah, so I, I, think, um, I, think people, I think people look at it uh, possibly the wrong way, and I think they conflate traffic with traffic growth. Um, so, like, blog traffic internet-wide is still strong and is still growing just because more people are getting on the internet and people use the internet more than ever because that's the world in which we live. Um, and, yeah, like, YouTube and Instagram are absolutely growing faster than written content are, mm -hmm. written content is. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't still people reading stuff. It's just, uh, it, it's, it's less of a growth opportunity, um, but also... That doesn't bother me too much because um, the the way I see it, like I never set out to. So I, I never set out with like the aspirations to be big in the same way that uh, someone like Elliot Hulse. So like whatever you think about Elliot, like everyone knows who the dude is like or someone like Rich Piana. Uh, my thought was never like I want to be like Internet famous like these people are and everyone in the fitness industry know who I am. Um it was more like, you know, I, I I want to like the work that I do and I like learning about stuff and the stuff that I like learning about is the stuff I want to write about. Um, and I saw that there weren't people putting out, there weren't many people putting out long form content 
uh, in the depth that, it, that I personally wanted to read. Um, so it was like, I had no idea how many, how many people would have an appetite for that. But it was like, well, I know I have an appetite for it, and no one is no one is serving that uh, desire I have. So, yeah, maybe there's some more weirdos out there, and there were more weirdos out there than I anticipated. So, cool. Yeah, I would say let's back up that story, Greg, and make you even more uncomfortable by God praising, damn it. By praising no. yourself. No! Right? We're all going to enjoy this, but I, no. yeah, I, I think I first started communicating with you in 2014, Greg. Greg, don't go. Um, I hope wow. you can still hear us. Uh, but uh, in, in 2014... I'm still here. Yeah. I've got the, the wireless headphones. I, I've seen you transition, I think. I forget the name of your first website, but then it became Strength Theory and now Stronger by Science. Can you just give that breakdown of your journey? So you also were... Was it the chief content officer for Juggernaut? Is that what it was? or? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So... Um... Give everyone a breakdown, Greg, of that, like the last essentially five years and what, uh, you know, Stronger by Science is. Uh, so I got really lucky um, because I, I, no, I did. So I was planning on just like either uh, just being like going to a gym and like being a trainer, coaching people or planning on going to grad school and going the academia route. Um, I didn't, I didn't really see like so i i didn't i didn't set out with a plan to do what i'm currently doing um essentially like i was obsessed with lifting and i'd read about it all the time and i wanted to talk about it all the time um and my my dear sweet then girlfriend now wife Lindsay, um she was the person who like bore the brunt of that and so she's also into lifting but not like on the same obsessive level that i am um and so i just talk her ear off all the time and eventually she was like, what if you started a blog so you could find other people to talk to about this stuff? Right. I was like, okay, like I can leave take me alone. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, pretty much just because I, I annoyed my girlfriend enough. Um, I, that feels weird to say, um, my, my now wife enough. Uh, I just started a blog to try to connect with other like-minded people who I could obsessively talk about lifting with. Um, and so like it just kind of organically started growing a readership and I never planned for that to be a business. Like I, it was just like me sharing random thoughts about stuff. Um, and then after graduation, uh, she got an internship out in California and um, basically like, uh, she followed me to college. So like she got first dibs for what we did after we graduated. Cause that's only fair. Um, and she was only guaranteed, I believe 12 weeks on the front end. And so, you know, like my experience was in training and you can't very well roll up to a gym and be like, Hey, I might be gone two months from now, but you should hire me anyways. Um, so like once she got that internship, um, I hit up Chad Wesley Smith and I was like, Hey, do you want, to not worry about content anymore. And he was like, yeah, that would be good. Uh, I will pay you to worry about content for me. So I uh, got that gig. And so at that point I was working online, still kind of thought that I'd either be going back to grad school really soon or um, like once Lindsay got like a more steady job, I'd find a gym to coach at. Um, but you know, I was online all day, so I had a lot more time to write. And then, like, during that period, like, readership of the site kind of exploded. And um, then when her internship finished up, uh, it wasn't a great employment situation. So um, she decided, like, no, like, I'm not going to stay here. So we were going to move back east. Uh, she didn't have other work lined up. And, like... Chad paid me very fairly for the work that I was doing, but we weren't making enough money for it to be like, uh, what we, we weren't in like a tremendously good financial situation at the time. Um, so I was like, eh, got a lot of readers. Like, let's see if this can kind of be a business. Um, so then I started like taking more training clients and doing a lot more of that. Um, and then Omar actually got me into like the product side of things. Um, so he read an article that I wrote about sleep back in like 2013, apparently liked it, made a video about it. So I just reached out and I was like, 
hey, dude, thanks for sharing my stuff. And then we just started talking and we were like, let's do an ebook together. And then we launched the ebook and I was like, oh, this is this is better money than I expected. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, that yeah, sounds then, so familiar. <laughs> yeah. So th- then at that point, I was like, you know, let's just try to make this thing work. Um, and so starting in like mid mid 2014, I started trying to like take it more seriously as a business. And it was more like this is kind of what I do now, not like this is what I'm doing until I can go do something else, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, it's just been a, a process of, of trying to grow over time. Amazing. Uh, awesome. Wait, can you give us just some numbers, man? Because I know, is it what is it called the Alexa ranking? What is, not the month, you don't have to reveal details you're not comfortable with, but again, talking about the level of complexity of information you provide for free to everyone out there, it's at a higher level of detail than other websites, other blogs, mm-hmm. but your traffic, you would think, oh, he's going into more detail you know, it's a niche, less people are probably going to read it, but it's actually the opposite. I don't know what numbers you feel comfortable sharing, uh, but... Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm an open book. Yeah. Our, our Alexa score is like, some, I don't check it often, but last I checked, it was like 75, 80,000, somewhere around there. Yeah. Um, and our daily readers, somewhere around 10 to 12,000 readers a day. Yeah. Um, generally like nine to 10 if we haven't published something in a while and then like 40 or 50 when we publish a new article. Yeah. And just for the folks who aren't familiar with those kind of metrics, how does that compare to a more mainstream but larger fitness website, would you say? Oh, I don't know. Uh, (laughs) I mean, I, so you can't, you can't like necessarily assume Alexa score scales one-to-one with readers because they, have some sort of like proprietary formula I don't know exactly how it works um but the the estimate i've seen for a site like t nation is that they get somewhere like a quarter million readers a day um mm-hmm. so we're about eh, somewhere around five percent as big as t nation which is something like that's it's it's not like it's not like a fraction of a percent so I but you've never right sold a that. product called Anaconda or Blue Indigo, so there is that, Greg. <laughs> that is true. That is true. <laughs> I, I guess probably a better comparison I probably could have uh, teed up for you there would be how it compares to other similar sites rather than the mainstream stuff. Like strong, I, strong lifts. Yeah, Greg. Uh, that guy, Medi, uh, the 5x5, five five, what's his website mm-hmm. called? Uh, I have no idea. Okay. Um, <laughs> The, I mean, I, I really, I really don't keep close tabs on other sites. Um, I just know that we're doing pretty well. <laughs> Greg does yeah. everything you're not supposed to. It does not survey the competition, see what other people are doing. Doesn't track their growth compared to his own. He's like, I like lifting. I want to talk in depth about it. I'm going to write some fantastic articles and grow that readership. Well, well I'll, I'll, so, I'll, so I'll when, say it when for you, you, if you when, need when me you, to. When you set up a business you're supposed to have like an avatar like the person you're trying to get your content out to who's like your ideal customer blah 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 and so like i feel like that's the only like market research i need and my avatar is me and so like (laughs) as long as i'm into what i'm doing thus far people other people have also liked it so like whatever well i i can definitely say for you that um having looked at some of the other websites of of uh, popular, popular. I, I'd say fitness intellectual science communicators, folks who write nerdy long form content. I don't know of anyone that that get close to to your numbers. So I think yeah. that's that's the point I was trying to get across. That's what we're trying and to get, can... Greg. Thanks for fumbling it. <laughs> Sick. No, so so I mean, this kind of snowballing off of that. Like I think I think one of the things I've done well is not pay attention to what other people are doing. Truly. Um, yeah. Cause, cause like ultimately going back to what I said before, like you can either try to, to be someone that everyone knows about, or you can try to like dominate a niche really, really well. Um, and I just haven't seen other people doing what we're doing. Um, so the, like a, a site like uh scifit.net, like those guys put out really, really good content, but it's more just like straight research, like crammed into an article with like 50 different references and, we try to like at least have like more of a narrative spin to it, um, yeah. so I don't think we're doing like the exact same thing. So, I I honestly can't think of like a super direct competitor. 
Um, so like, I don't know, like I'm the only business in my niche as far as I see it. Uh, so like, I don't care what other people are doing. Like they're not in my niche. And if other people move in, I think that's awesome. Cause I think ultimately that will draw like more people into kind of the nerdy little bubble I've built for myself. Would you, would you say that Lyle is in your, in your niche just to bring up something controversial? Like, do do you think that? Thanks for getting us, Jeff, our clip for the, for the podcast. Yeah. We're going to yeah. start right there. No, no, because cause I'm just trying to think, like, I think of Examine and, like, I think of Lyle, and then I think of, like, mm -hmm. research reviews. Um, but I don't think that anyone has really gone, like, the level of depth is just insane. I mean, like, the, the, the amount of math in your articles is crazy. Like, I try to, because I reach a mainstream audience myself, and, like, the questions I get are just insane like mm -hmm. you know it, not to discredit any of my subscribers but it's just like this must be the first time you've heard of any of this stuff right like what mm -hmm. is a macro type questions so like i just have like twelve thousand readers a day like i'm trying to figure out who these twelve thousand people are who are able to comprehend that level of detail or even want that level like you say you make it for yourself but it's like how many greg knuckles are there you know what i mean it's like it's, i'm saying this it's like it's, it's impressive because you're obviously there, there's there's a lot you know high up in terms of like where the reader's comprehension must be and where your content is you know you're here i can't imagine your audience being anywhere close to here you know I could uh, be wrong. Okay, so so one of the things i do is i i attempt to make content that you don't necessarily so you need like a basic level of background knowledge to to grasp but i don't want you to need I, I don't want you to need like a degree's worth of like exercise science knowledge to grasp um mm -hmm. so like i i think like will this be understandable to someone who is like generally intelligent and knows the basics and then like when i go back and like reread articles before i publish them i'm like uh so one of the things that helped me a lot is my wife is my editor and she's kind of like the audience I'm trying to get it out to. So like, she's really, really smart, but like, she doesn't have a background in exercise science. So anything that a generally intelligent person would get, like she'll get, but then anything where there's like a, a unrealistic level of assumed background knowledge, she's like, I don't really see where you made this leap. And I'm like, oh, like it would make a lot more sense if you knew this. And so then I put that into the article. And so I, I think it's, I think it's accessible to most people. Um, they just have to have the patience for it. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't even think it's patience, Greg. I think, um, I think the discriminator and, and the differentiation between what you're asking, uh, Jeff and what Greg actually does is that I do think someone with a basic ability to decent reading comprehension and a very low level of requisite knowledge, I think can get through uh, even Greg's more complex articles. I would say a, an interested uh, person with a high school education who is a personal trainer and has been for a couple of years can get through the majority of Greg's articles. I think, though, that the only people who want to get through Greg's articles are the people who nerd out on this stuff. I think that is probably the, the main factor. And he puts right at the front, though, hey, this is 3,000 words. Yep. Hey, this, this is a deep dive on X, Y, and Z. And I think the difference is that people who just want to be told what to do but and want to make sure that it's science-based probably aren't Greg's audience. It's people who actually are really enjoyed in the curiosity behind it, how it works. And it's the same kind. I, I see it as the same people who would want to listen to an astrophysics podcast or read an article or, or like Bill Nye. It's like they're actually interested in some of the, the nerdy science stuff. And I think that's, that's a niche that really wasn't filled even by some of the bloggers you're talking about who, like Lyle, for example, or when this was a more popular common thing where you would blog about something in depth, but from an almost kind of like outcome-based uh, rigorous focus, and here's what you do in the end, or here's what it means, and it's very important to be correct, rather than having this kind of narrative style and tone of curiosity and interest and isn't this just cool shit man and i think that that's the uh i think that's what was missing in my opinion i just want to applaud you greg on doing a great job with that um and uh yeah so so 
I think again, I'll, I would love to hear kind of a similar story of you, Jeff, of how, how you how you got to be here today. Uh, the, the 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 very popular uh, only YouTuber that I'm aware of with this kind of following who does these deep dives on science and not just as something that's maybe every third or fourth video, but your bread and butter, yeah. which is incredible to me because you know I've I've um, I've had the privilege of being on Omar's channel a bunch of times and so has. You know, you know, Brad Schoenfeld, James Krieger, a few others, but it's like Omar's going, right, I'm going to weave in some science, but I, I know that if, or maybe I, I think that if I only did that, there's no way I could keep growing or that wouldn't be the best way. And then you come and just kick the door down and you say, hey man, check out this awesome figure. Yeah. And before, <laughs> yeah. and before we go on, I actually want to set up Jeff properly from being in the YouTube space because I feel that he might, it might be that Canadian politeness where he might be too humble to say some things, uh, but... In the YouTube space, I've been in it for the last uh, decade. It was an old adage kind of that if you're more evidence-based, whatever that means, if you're trying to provide information, practical uh, takeaways, if you compare those channels to the uh, leaders in that space, if there's a huge disparity. And what was that about? Was that because people don't want that information? People just want to listen to muscles? A variety of different reasons. But for the longest time, for the last... You know, only in the last five years have certain channels uh, begun to emerge, right? But even then, if you compare their subscriber base to the leaders in YouTube, they have a couple million subscribers, whereas maybe the leading channel that provides practical information has a couple hundred thousand. So it's still a big gap. And what's more is, uh, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, you had a podcast. Was it 2014 Ice Cream for PRs? So Yeah, I changed the name in... I think 2015 or something, just to okay. the Jeff Nippard podcast. I'm still yeah. active, but I only post about maybe once a month yeah. tops. Yeah. And so you were in the space for quite some time before you, I don't want to say change direction, but provided a new level of complexity of information that also was simultaneously more accessible. And this was at a time where if you took a look at someone being in that space for quite some time, um, the leaders once again on youtube were going counter to that so it wasn't like you weren't uh, taking observations and oh wow these these evidence-based practical channels are really taking off i want to jump mm -hmm. on board it was more going counter where it's like you know on youtube it's about captivating an audience and four minutes or they're going to go away and you're like now nah, we're going to do 15 minutes we're going to go <laughs> even more complex on the information and i'm just going to bet on it and then it turned and what turned out is that when i said the fastest i mean i'm sure there's there's some bodybuilders that have had uh, astronomical rises in their popularity, but in terms of real, practical, useful information, your channel has had the most meteoric of ascensions, I would say. So can you just chronicle that, that journey from being on YouTube prior with a, a different style for a few years? What made that transition and that whole process? Yeah, um, sure. So yeah, like you said, I I think I started out actually mostly just documenting my journey as a bodybuilder. So like Eric will remember in 2014, I won my pro card in natural bodybuilding and I was actually making videos then, but they'd get like a hundred views from my friends and they'd just be like, I'd plop the tripod down, record every set and just let it roll raw. Yep. <laughs> um, so that was like 2014 YouTube, Jeff. Then I think I might've started in, no, that was on the channel that I still have. I probably had like four or 500 subscribers or something like that. Um, then... I think what I started doing then was like just bare bones, like plop the tripod down on my coffee table and record a video about like the post-workout window or, or, or something like that and just talk about that for like way too long, way too rambly and like those never caught any traction either. Then I think what kind of caused me to turn the corner was when I started doing interviews. Um, so I had the podcast earlier, but I started doing round tables. So I think, I think Eric was actually a part of my first <laughs> one, which was either, I think it might've been the... Rev I forget now, but I th it might have been the volume roundtable or the reverse diet debate. It was like four or five years ago now. Both. And Greg, Greg was on the volume one too. Oh yeah, Greg yeah. was, that's right, that's right. And those at the time, and for me, like as someone with like a thousand subscribers, were getting like 20,000 views in a week, 20, 30,000 views, which is a lot, right? And I think it's just because we kind of collaborated our audiences and really shared them to the masses. I uh, thought that know, was the peak, man. I just, I yeah. just remember when, when we had the, uh, we were like, oh, we got Lane Norton, Greg Knuckles, Mike Isertel, Eric Helms, Menno Henselman's all on the same thing. Like, and I don't and think we Minnow saw was these. on it. Menno yeah, was, was on the reverse diet one. Uh, he wasn't on the volume one, but he was on the reverse okay. diet. There, yeah, there was yeah. a couple big roundtables. I think like three. Yeah. Um, and I thought, like in my perception, when these got like fourteen thousand views in a week, I was like, 
this is the peak. Of, <laughs> this is as good as it gets for our nerd circle. Well, well, and it's the, like because we recruited Menno's mom and my mom. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, <laughs> so um, the crazy thing is, is I, I just my last interview was with Eric Trexler, who is I think the director or the research director with uh, Stronger by Science, uh, Greg's website, yep. and um, that video did a hundred thousand views in one day, and now it's over two hundred and fifty thousand views, and it's like an hour and a half long, and we're just talking about metabolism. So like it's pretty crazy how much that's grown um and i think that that is a function of just me changing my style and like learning from look it took me a long time like a lot of people will see the rise as like meteoric like it happened really fast but it, t it really wasn't at all like i I, I uploaded my first video to youtube i think in 2012 and it was just a bodybuilding uh video on a different channel that i'm not active on anymore um and then ever since then i've just been kind of refining it so that's like seven years, right? Um, but anyway, I think that what turned the corner in was like my first taste of like somewhat semi-viral content were those interviews. And I, th I think the volume round table is like close to maybe quarter of a million views now too, which is pretty crazy given how long the, the content is and how in retrospect poorly structured it is. I mean, like I watch them, I just like some, occasionally I'll go back to get clips and I'm like, oh my goodness, like, as an interviewer, I just feel like I did this all wrong. And it, well, let's it, run it, it back. It, it, well, hey, I'm down. I mean, yeah, <laughs> why not? <laughs> That's a great idea. Um, I've done that with so many videos now because I just, anytime someone will like send me anything from my catalog, it's just like, ugh, like I ugh, can't believe there was a time I published that. But anyway, th those videos included. Um, but still, nonetheless, it, it's not that the information wasn't good. It's just like I feel like my software was bugging. I had, poor audio like the, the the content wasn't organized enough in my opinion anyway um but but those i think were my first crack at the can in terms of like the youtube algorithm and then i think what i just started to do was just really focus on the quality uh, probably more than anything like i, I uh, eventually did a video where i was like i'm gonna spend more time on this than I normally would. It was a, a back training video. And I was like, you know, I have all this information and articles, so on and so forth. Let me really try to integrate this and like put my editing skills to use because I kind of developed a interest in that and a knack for that. And uh, the video popped off like it, it's got over a million views now. And then I was like, hmm, well, maybe, you know, there's, there's something to this. Maybe I could try to replicate it. And that was what eventually started my Science Explained series. And, and mm -hmm. most of those videos have like at least 500,000 views now. And most of those videos will have a reference trail of like, you know, 15 to 25 articles. Um, and uh, those gained a lot of traction. So I kind of just kept going with those. Um, and then started to expand my content because I didn't want to just be doing that. Um, and then throughout all of this, I think what m may have been a big part of the backbone, like in, in terms of my rise was probably, I did keep this ongoing personal connection in terms of like my own personal journey. So like people would still me still see me go through like my cutting and bulking cycles. They'd see me if I was competing in powerlifting or what have you, I would still document that. Uh, I would still show some of my personal life, what meals I'm making, that sort of thing. So people who may not necessarily be interested in a video on muscle memory or, or something might watch it anyway, just because they feel interested in what I might be up to or what I have to say. Uh, so I feel like that was a big part of it as well. Um, so I had the sort of like in-depth science explained videos. I have the vlogs where I showcase my own journey, still keep them. They still have kind of like an informative backbone, but they're much more personal and m much less rigorous in terms of the actual content, um, much more casual. And then I also still more or less maintained the interview style, which continued to do better as my channel grew and people still like them. Very few people complain that they're too long or anything like that. Um, and I feel like it was really probably those three bits of content that work for me. And now I've continued to evolve that into different types of series and so on. But th those were kind of what took, took it from like a pretty big channel, but still within that, I guess, like science-based echo chamber to some extent to like, now I have people who are still very interested in science to people who's like, this is their first YouTube video they've seen on fitness. And it's just a massive range of knowledge bases. 
Yeah, I, I think I think what you're doing on YouTube is really, really good. Because, uh, like, man, I remember trying to look for, like, fitness content on YouTube, like, 10 years ago or whatever. Um, and it was just, it was a wasteland. It was a goddamn cesspool. Oh, yeah. Um, so, like, I, I'm sure a lot of people's first, like, video exposure to fitness stuff is probably still bad. But, like, a certain percentage of them, it's going to be you. And, like, that's awesome. That's putting them, like, that's giving them, like, a multi-year head start on where, like, I was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, and I, I really liked it. What I want to unpack is how you said you look back on your roundtables and you feel the sense of, you described it as, ugh. And I want to unpack that, <laughs> the, ugh. Because I think on the surface, for someone who's not necessarily... Uh, just just a fitness information consumer because they could probably say oh well it, Greg's videos are very sorry uh, Jeff's videos are very concise uh, they're easy to see they're visually stimulating they hold my attention span they can say perhaps why they think that they are uh, watching it and they they stay on it but I think for the average maybe up and coming content producer especially if they come from an evidence based background they won't. And I'm speaking from experience. They wouldn't see the difference between your roundtables then and now. And the reason is, is because they're not focused on the right things. And I'm again speaking from my own experience. The culture of the evidence-based quote-unquote fitness professional or science communicator was one where we kind of looked at um, fitness. Uh, fitness information is black or white. You're either part of team good guy or good girl. Uh, where sorry, good guy or good gal to make sure I'm not infantilizing anyone. And you're, you're putting out <laughs> content that is, um, that is like of a high intellectual rigor and that's the main thing you focus on or you're part of the, the quote unquote marketers, right? Uh, and, and almost eschewing an entire art, uh, science if you will, or, or skill set around communicating, packaging information, getting it across to people and making it palatable uh, to the point where o only thing you care about is the scientific rigor and whether it is correct. And I came from that cloth, and I think it inhibited the growth of what I've been trying to do uh, until I started to see people come up way later than me and far surpass me and get a bigger reach. And that's not that's what it took me to start changing and start paying attention. And now I can actually see the difference, but for years I couldn't. Um, and I think well, you guys are both leading a bit of a paradigm shift uh, in, in showing the attention to those details. And I think, uh, you know, Jeff, everything you talked about is a contributing factor. Greg, I think Lindsay is your, is your trump card because you oh, yeah. have someone. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I've seen that now working with her on mass as she has just an, an incredible wealth of knowledge and skill uh, around uh, communication, marketing, and, and, and packaging things and, and getting it across. And I think that really can't be undersold or underplayed. Um, and the amount that the quality of a video or the, the way that a blog post is written goes into how it's read versus just the raw content itself uh, is something that the average kind of science nerd probably uh, doesn't even know matters. Uh, can you guys comment on that a little bit? Do you want to go first? You go ahead. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, Canadian stand but no, like, so I, I, I'm going to out Canada you every time. <laughs> I, I think that, uh, I think that's absolutely huge. Um, so uh, pretty much everyone's experienced this. Like if you land on, so if you click a link on social media, on Reddit, on Google, whatever, um, when you land on the page, you, you make an assessment of what you think you're about to get. Uh, either consciously or subconsciously, pretty much automatically. Um, like, if the site looks clean or, like, if it's a video, if, like, there's a smooth intro and, like, the production quality is good. Uh, like, with a site, like, if the layout is good and the site functions well and it has fonts that are appropriate and text that's actually readable, um, those are all, like, subconscious cues that this is probably more legit. Um it's not necessarily a good cue because there's a lot of absolutely bogus information out there that either comes in really appealing videos or like a really professional looking website. Um, but that, that is just like an association people make because that's how it tends to work. Like if you land on a, a blog spot 
post or a blog spot site that looks like it hasn't been updated in five years and was built on like the web 2.0 uh even if the information is really really good you go into it with kind of like a negative bias against it um so as as much as it would be great if it was solely about the information and humans were perfectly rational actors and could uh like perfect perfectly identify truth from falsehoods and only consumed content from the purveyors of truth uh that, that's not how the world works that's nowhere close to how the world works um so like if if there if there is like an edge you can get just from having good quality stuff like a website that looks professional writing that's easy and pleasant to read um videos that look good and are professionally produced um without having to sacrifice the quality of the content i think i think you're an idiot for not availing yourself of that um And I also think that, I think that beyond quality, um, I think accessibility is really, really important. Um, Because, so one one of the reasons I write long form content is because I can't write short form form content. Because if if I was writing, so if my audience was like you three guys, um, I could probably cut the length of my articles by 60% because I know you know stuff that I wouldn't have to explain. Um, but then it's not, it's just not going to be readable to the majority of people. Um, and so like, and and I see you do this in your videos as well, Jeff, like there's, there's a lot more jargon you could use that you don't use. Um, and I, I think there's, I think there's some degree of like comfort with yourself that you, you have to get to before you can do that. Um, cause like early on, like I wanted to use big words so people would think that I was smart. Um, and then I realized that's just stupid. Uh, I, I'd rather a hundred thousand people read an article and benefit from it than a hundred people read the article and be like, oh, that guy's smart, but also seems like a pompous jackass, you know, (laughs) or Um, just not get it or, or miss the point. Yes. So, uh, you know, I, I think, I think we need to stop thinking of people as like solely rational actors and, you know, Mm -hmm. look, look back at like the Greeks and the idea of rhetoric and like you have the ethos, you have the logos, you have the pathos. It's not just all logos. Well said, I think for me, and then I'll let Jeff talk, uh, (laughs) is, uh, I had to get over my own bullshit before (laughs) I could start producing uh, good content that acknowledged all of that. And I had to, to get appealed to my own mission statement. I had to have people close to me say like, why aren't you on Instagram? And me go, look, it's a cesspool of blah, 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 blah. Or why aren't you on YouTube? Like, oh, it's this, 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 and all this, like, you know, I, I'm I'm not quite a millennial, and I hate the new thing. And uh, and then, then they say, all right, well, what's your goal, Eric? And I was like, well, I want to reach as many people as possible and help them. And they're like, so do you see how you're dumb? And I went, oh, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. You know, and then all of a sudden, I, I removed this block and my, my willingness to actually go, right, what's the best way for me to reach a lot of people? Uh, and then all of a sudden it was uh, logarithmic growth on my, on my learning of this stuff because I understood its importance. But I think a lot of people just aren't there yet. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's my little two cents. But I totally agree, and I'd love to hear from you now, Jeff. Yeah, well, Instagram is a cesspool of blah, blah, blah. So mm. you might have been right. <laughs> but I'm now I'm there with it, blowing my way to blah, well, blah. Well, we're sponsored by FitT, guys, so we should just slow down here and be careful who we attack. Yeah. Fit tea, the only true way to get apps. <laughs> I think I think Instagram is probably my least favorite platform. I just feel like it, it's it just forces people into the the scroll and it, the attention span is barely even seconds. Like whereas on YouTube, you know, an average watch time it might be four or five minutes or what have you. Um, so it's just a total. It's just it's hard to ha- I think accomplish depth on Instagram and also be wide reaching, yeah. but. Who knows? Maybe there'll be like a fifth guest here next time. Squad who's University. Like crazy di- I'd throw right. them in there. Oh, honestly. okay, fair. Yeah, oh, fair. yeah. But, yeah. But I actually, I, I actually don't. I actually don't follow them. But that's I, cool. That they said, com- if true. I completely agree. But they have it. But he hasn't done what you've done, the equivalent of YouTube, where for Instagram, there's you know fitness personalities that have millions of followers, and he's still at maybe a couple hundred thousand. So he's not on that scale ability. Mm. It's not the same. Or is he, it half a million? He's, pre- he's pretty big, bro. No, well, I think it's over. 
Oh, is it now? Oh, yeah. He, he had so he so not to uh, completely divert our topic, but I think he's probably had really fast growth recently because he's been doing a giveaway and some several uh, several other things over the last six months. What did he have? Oh, eight twenty six. I said oh, half a million. So I'm off. I, eight, yeah, eight, on we gotta give we gotta give Aaron Aaron Doctor Aaron Horshig some, uh, some yeah. props here. He, he's close to a million followers <laughs> yeah. on Instagram, and I actually think the landscape's quite similar between YouTube and Instagram. Mm -hmm. It's largely bad. The, you, the YouTubers shining, are better. <laughs> what you say, a bro? couple shining <laughs> beacons of good content. Because honestly, I think we have about eighty percent of the good channels on this podcast right now on YouTube that are also have a lot of followers. Well, I just think that the platform in some sense has to determine the content. Um, so like on YouTube, you have the opportunity to produce super long videos like this, where you might only have, a, I don't know, like a thousand people who make it all the way through. But still think about the amount of watch time that that is. It's enormous. Whereas on Instagram, even if you have a nice post from Squat University, like not, let's use another example from science person, they're, they're can only be so much depth that you can fit in the ca caption unless you're going way down into the comments or if you're posting multiple times a day, which, you know what, maybe there is a way, maybe there is a way you could do it. But it's just, I don't think that you could accomplish the same depth, at least not as easily as you could on YouTube. Yeah, I think that YouTube 100%. is actually, especially at the moment where it is kind of trendy and I, I can get to that, but it, it, it's trendy to give information on YouTube now. People really like it. And I think it in part probably is because of that history you've talked about where like you've had all of these bro scientists and just like vapid influencers, so on and so forth, who've dominated the field and now people are ready for something with substance, I think. Um, and, and that's the feedback that I get a lot. It's like, if I go to an expo, they'll be like, you know, all of this, like <laughs> people who are, are fans now, but they'll be like, you know, I, I like that you're different from all of this sort of thing. So that they're looking for something that's counter to the state of the current culture, I think. And that might've been part of my success. Uh, but um, I think that I, what I wanted to comment on was Greg's point about uh, the visuals or the, the appearance of professionalism. Um, there was a study, and I don't remember anything about it, but I watched a crash course video on it. So maybe you can link it uh, in the show notes, uh, Omar. But um, it, it basically, I forget what the website was, but it was like some kind of like food and safety website or something like that. And they had an actual government official website and they showed the subjects that, and then they showed the subjects some blog, but it, it was, it was a, it was a food blog basically. Right. So you can probably imagine the level of depth to it or the, uh, legitimacy of it. And well, what basically one was legitimate, one wasn't, but the blog had like very nice text, lots of graphs. Um, it, it was laid out in a way that looked professional. It was simple. Dude, you can put anything in a graph and a tremendous amount of people yeah. will believe it. <laughs> and, and they asked the people, you know, which one looks more reliable and far and away more people thought that the blog one was more reliable, more official. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so how you design it is super, super important. Like it, it's number one, I really, in terms of getting people in, I mean, at least it is on YouTube because on YouTube, you have two things. Basically you have the title and the thumbnail, uh, to, to get people in. And when they land on your video, there has to be something that's going to entice them to want to get in there and see what it's all about. Also the view count. Um, but you can't really do much about that. Um, so I think it's just hugely important that if your goal is to reach more people, you just have to consider that people are looking at the screen with their eyeballs and that's how people's brains work. Um, and, and it's interesting because like, I think that on this point, I actually get it worse than Greg because I think I kind of like people perceive what I do as har harsher clickbait than what probably Greg <laughs> does. <laughs> um, oh, I've, I've gotten some clickbait yeah? pushback. Okay, fair enough. But that's probably because your audience is even more averse to clickbait. So t yeah. to them, I would just be so far gone that I'm just out of the dis I'm canceled. Oh, I mean, I mean? <laughs> like I, I see when I see your stuff get shared on Reddit, they're all, I see a bunch of people complain like, oh, this clickbait title, blah, blah, blah. I'm yeah, like, yeah. I'm like, dude, you just don't know how the fucking game is played. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like he's, like he, he's either going to clickbait or he's going to sacrifice like probably two thirds of his views. Like, yeah. Let's talk about that actually for a second, the yes. whole clickbait, yes. because that's a whole, that's a, a landmine. I, I had a question for Greg, but we'll save that in terms of the complexity of information to jump right into this. I'm actually going to have Jeff 
uh, we're going to put you on the spot here because I think marketing and being able to read the audience and read YouTube and, as you said, the algorithm is very important. And your titles balance that fine line. Uh, by and large, I remember there was one where you put the title. What was it? Bad news. I sent you a message after I saw the like to dislike where people it was absurd how upset they got over a title for all <laughs> intents and purposes. Like it's cl it's clear like. It, it was clear by the thumbnail to me that it was bad news in the context of what happened to you guys. But the I don't want to call it unreasonable, the pushback that you got. But other than that, your balance of titling, I would <laughs> say, has never, okay. has never exceeded, <laughs> uh, has never gone into the clickbait territory. But why I want to put you on the spot and show how good you are, Jeff, I want you to title this episode of Iron Culture Podcast because oh, we would, I'd we love would, to, yeah, yeah, we would have something like no, Eric. What would you call? What would you call this episode, Eric? Just say what you would call uh, it, and then uh, Jeff. I would call it uh, the future opposite. of science communication in social <laughs> media. Yeah. That's not bad. I like, eh. it, mine are it, never bad. They're I, just not I, no, good. But it, it leaves it, open. It leaves it, open the possibility that like it leaves too much open. Like it could be bad. It could be wishy washy. Like it, it doesn't. What what you might want to do is like the best way to communicate science or, or the best way to communicate something that shows. Give me something. Greg, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I, I would say. Greg, go ahead. I would say one weird trick to <laughs> 10x yeah, your sorry. online following and add three inches to your penis. There you yeah. go. <laughs> now we got we got a winner right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, what was the original question? So, what would you title <laughs> as an example? What would you title? Uh, what would you title oh. an episode like this as an example? Well, to go into your mindset titles, of how titles you are title. interesting because, like, I I take them so seriously yes. that. Sometimes I'll plan the title before I plan what I'm going to do. Only um, and it usually would know comes that, to yeah. me over the course of like I'm not exaggerating. It's probably like at least a week. It, like some and, and if I if it comes to me, I'll put a note in my phone. And usually for every video, there'll be like five different options that I'll eventually like choose from, and I'll send them to like a group of people and be like, you know, which one do you think you'd click or whatever. So like, it, there's a lot of thought that goes into it. So putting me on the spot, I don't know, but like I find positive language for whatever reason really seems to do well like you, you want people to think that like this is something really good that they might not otherwise have if they don't watch it you know what i mean so like the future of science communication makes it sound like well maybe you're just going to tell a story about where you see science communication going whereas we have more information to offer than that so like you could say how to um or you you could go the exact opposite route and do it negative. You could be like what most people do wrong when communicating science and fitness or something like that, right? And that, that does well too, but the reason you don't want to do that too much is that I find that can then attack or attract, attract a type of audience that uh, want that call out type of content. And that if that's not yeah. what you're doing, then it may not be worth it in the long run. But once in a while, it's probably not going to hurt, especially if the content ends up actually being really positive and not disrespectful or whatever. So hopefully uh, ours should fall in that category. What about yeah, you... something like what about something like fitness scammers destroyed with facts and logic? <laughs> That's, with yeah. Greg, Greg's got, logic Greg's got this game figured out. But let, let me ask you guys before I have a question for Greg. But just you two guys in terms of a titling, I I would say Greg, like I you know the, your definitive guide on the squats. It's it's quite clear uh, on how to squat, what you're getting into. So I, if people accuse you of you know uh, clickbait or titling, that that to me is confusing. Jeff, I want to know how you balance that line between, as you said, the thumbnail. So there's two things that you can influence people. And you said you can't influence the view count. The thumbnail that you put out and then the title that people see with the video. And those two basically determine the traffic, that the, the initial traffic that the video will get. So what's your thought process going into those two things in order to still keep your ethos, what you're about, um, be in line, but try and attract as wide of an audience as possible? Yeah. Um, well, for me, I feel like it. Um, let me think here. So I think that there's like a pattern of things. It's kind of hard to like formulate it down into one thing. But like, generally speaking, like at least put I'm, I'm going to put myself in the thumbnail. Like I've experimented with like trying because some of these like video essay channels will just put like a really nice image. Like I did one video on like how different cooking methods affect the nutritional profile of food. And I was like, hmm, some of the popular videos on this literally just have like a thumbnail of a microwave, but they might have been uploaded, you know, four or five years ago. So I actually did give it a shot because I was getting feedback from some people that like, well, 
based on your appearance, I didn't expect the content to be as rigorous as it is, right? And, and it was a disincentive for me to click. I would imagine these are Greg's viewers who are giving me that, that feedback, right? <laughs> um, so I was like, well, maybe I'll try the removing myself from it. And then when they come in, they'll see that there's this good information. So I, you know, always put effort into the thumbnail, make sure it's bright, make sure it's aesthetic, well-designed, so on and so forth. But that video did like, a quarter of the views of if I'm in the thumbnail, right? So, and, and I did that a couple times, like an A-B testing, and it's just, it, there's no question if I'm in it, it's, it's better. Obviously, it, you know, you don't have to put me in this thumbnail. <laughs> like, that would just be your face. <laughs> but on my in. channel, on my channel, it, it clearly works. And then, honestly, like, physique shots are almost always gonna do better because people think that if you have a good physique, then you know what you're talking about. Like, this is just, it's just the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I do think you, you brought up something really important, Jeff, was the uh, how street cred, quote unquote, in, in, in the fitness industry, it, it almost matters implicitly. And I think it's something even intellectual people uh, like you need to see that someone walks the walk a little bit. And I think um, not taking anything away from either one of you, but Jeff, you're a, you're a very gifted bodybuilder and Greg, you're a very gifted power lifter. And those things were apparent at the time you guys came on the scene as well. Like, oh shit, there's this, this new kid on the block who's running these really in-depth articles and the dude squats 700 pounds? Well, I gotta listen. You know, I can't write him off. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. Um, yeah. Hey, oh, this new guy on the block, he looks like that, natural bodybuilder, and he's got the science. So I think, I guess it, it's really hard to assess this, but how much, is that just a, is that a, uh, a threshold to cross and then you, you can be listened to? Or is that something that leverages a large part of your guys' success, do you think? Um, just speaking for myself, I think that that was, I think that was absolutely like an important foot in the door. Um, these days, like, uh, I, I pretty frequently, so I don't rarely share like training videos on Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I do, like, I'll get a bunch of comments and like quite a few messages from people who are like, "Oh, dude, I've been following your content for years. I didn't, I didn't even know you were strong." Yeah. Um, so like, I don't think so. I, I think that that absolutely helped like get things off the ground. Um, and I mean, I'm I'm sure it absolutely still plays a role in things moving forward. But I don't think it's like as pivotal of a thing anymore. I would agree. I think that um, it kind of depends on the platform. Like I feel, I'm not surprised that for Greg, it doesn't matter as much because his thumbnails for his blog are not, usually not him, right? And that doesn't seem to matter. Um, for me, it hurts me if it's not me. So I feel like when I'm in shape, well, so when I'm leaner, my videos tend to do better actually. Um, and it depends on the platform. Like I feel like you'd have a spectrum of how much the way you look matters. And you have like probably blogs down here and then you'd have Instagram here, right? I feel like YouTube is somewhere in between. Um, because you have examples of really successful informative channels that don't show themselves. So like Pitcher Fit, I, I know the guy who runs that channel, super successful YouTube channel. Um, and nobody knows what he looks like because it's all animations. Yeah. Have you heard of, have you heard of it, Eric, or have you seen it? I've heard of it, but I haven't watched it. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's pretty really good. good. It's yeah. really good. Yeah. Um, and it reaches, you know, a very mainstream audience and gets lots of views because, you know, the information is good. They're very punchy and they're well produced. Uh, so I think that there's certainly a way around it. But if you have anything like to show, I think that you should show. So like if it's a transformation, like if you used to be overweight and you lost a bunch of weight, like sh show the transformation, not necessarily the end result. But whatever is going to be more visually impressive is what you need to showcase. And almost anyone who's into fitness, I mean, unless you're doing it totally wrong, <laughs> you should have built some amount of traction so that you can show off your results to some level. And it really does matter to people. I don't think that means that you can't make it without it. Like there are the odd examples, but I think that you'd always make it more with it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would yeah. say I'm trying to think because, as you said, Jeff, Picture Fit totally bypassed the image standard of needing either to be a certain level of strength or a certain level of aesthetics in order to grow his channel. But I'm trying to think now of a YouTube fitness channel, and I think your spectrum is correct, where blogs are over here where they're not as important. Instagram, definitely all the way here on YouTube somewhere uh, in between. But I'm trying to think of a YouTube fitness channel that has over a million followers, subscribers, that doesn't have either an impressive physique or, or something like just someone that, let's say an average 
Joe, which is a pure communicator that is, you know, not super lean, not super jacked, or not very strong, that has achieved that level. Picture Fit did a fantastic job of, as you said, it's all animation. So, uh, you know, you don't need to appeal to that authority then. Yeah, um, but I, I think that's something that people in the evidence-based community could do a little bit better is show that. Now, the issue with it is until there's some kind of paradigm shift where people who are on Reddit decide that, well, maybe it is actually better if you get more people, more eyes on this and get them involved in the community, um, you may get that pushback from the you know militant evidence-based crowd you're selling uh, your body so and for example i mean like if eric started posting a ton of ab flexes like i might it might bother me a little mm. like, you know what i mean like it seems to go against your brand and i noticed True. this initially myself too because like if you look at my early interviews it was literally a side by side of me and menno right um but now it's just simply not worth it like I put too much effort into the content for me to lose viewership over something as trivial as that for me. Um, and plus, my, I'm not really trying to hit that militant evidence-based crowd anyway, because I feel like they already know everything I'm talking about for the most part. They already know Greg so. Knuckles. Yeah, they, they've got Greg's <laughs> blog, so they don't Well, I mean, I, I think like, um, the, I view clickbait or like thumbnail bait, I view it like purely through a utilitarian lens. Like if someone searches, uh, how to train back and there's like five videos that initially show up on their screen and yours is one of them um like if if you reasonably think that your video is the best one that's going to show up when people search for it then at that point it's a zero-sum game like they're going to click on your video or another video and if you think yours is going to provide more net utility than the other stuff out there like you do what you got to do one to get more views for yourself but then two, to take more views from like less quality content. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that, I think that it's not a, a incredibly difficult thing to justify. Um, yeah. and I think that, I, I think it's one of those things where it kind of depends how you position it. So if you're like, you know, I look great. Here's this shot of me in the thumbnail. I'm going to tell you this stuff and you should believe it because I look great, then it's like, okay, like that's shady. Even if the information is good, I think that that's still kind of a net negative because you're then kind of like setting this tone of like, and this is the correct way to acquire information, right? So try to find out, like try to find Jack dudes and they're mm -hmm. telling you the good stuff. Um, I think if you use that to lure people in, but then also... Uh, present them not just with good information, but also with like a correct way of like thinking and evaluating evidence and how to come to like beliefs about these topics. Um, like I don't see anything wrong with it at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, I think, I think, that, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I like the way you're, you're framing that, that if, if our goal is to help people and mm -hmm. we know what works to get people to read or, or watch something, um, then we have to consider those as, as viable tools from a very utilitarian standpoint. And I think the only counterpoint anyone might have is uh, are, you, are you keeping that, that incorrect cultural, I'm going to use cultural here with, with the quotes around it because it's like the lifting culture, if you will, cultural belief that someone who's jacked or looks good or who has the quote unquote street cred is automatically right alive by having that be the way you leverage it. And one thing I actually appreciate um, is when uh, an influencer or a content creator acknowledges that but still does it and kind of breaks the fourth wall, if you will. Like uh, Jeff, you did, you did this not too long ago. You were saying, hey, you guys lambasted me for using this clickbait and then I didn't use clickbait on the next one and I got way less views. You know, and I, I really, I think I appreciate the viewers into accepting the clickbait. Yeah, it's yeah. very smart. <laughs> <laughs> well, not well, even just. Well, <laughs> let me just yeah. share my experience with that because it it might be enlightening. Um, so that that video that you mentioned, the the bad news video, right, where my girlfriend and I lost our luggage. Um, so that video, as you said, got I think it was three thousand likes and three thousand dislikes. So three thousand people 
were bothered enough by it to like click the the down button. Um, my thought process was kind of like yours, not not to like defend myself on that video, but um, because it, it was ultimately that video that made me decide that it's just not worth it for my personal brand to do stuff like that. Um, so since then, I, I haven't done anything even remotely close to that. But to me, it was almost like obvious irony, like almost like it was like I'm clearly trolling. You know what I mean? Like it's right. me and my it's me and my girlfriend. We're like over, like we got our hands up, like or we're like like this, and it's like there's a glow around us and we're like it's so staged my photographer clearly took this like super high res photo of us like it's so obviously staged that this is going to be a vlog it's like if you're a part of the youtube culture then you know that this is just part of the language right um but obviously a lot of people didn't perceive it that way because my whole brand is built around trust and integrity and so on and so forth so i think that people weren't necessarily offended by the fact that I clickbaited, it's it's more so the fact that like it just felt off brand for me, and they're like, I don't mm -hmm. want to see you go that direction, right? Um, so yep. I get that. But the reason, I, I I mean, obviously part of the reason is is like I'm like, well, you know, I flew my videographer down here to LA. That's like a couple thousand dollars of an expense. You know, I'm here for the expo. I uh, want to make a bit of content. You know, it's. It, I'm here for the weekend to see my subscribers. I want people to see me interact with my subscribers, so on and so forth. So like, yeah, I want people to see this bit of content that we made and not much happened uh, in terms of like uh, anything that is going to draw an average viewer in, right? Except for this losing the, the luggage thing. And to me, I feel like I want people to watch my vlogs because I feel like that's what connects people to Jeff the person rather than just like the science communicator, which is what I think will ultimately give me much more longevity. Because if you completely isolate yourself as a person, I think at least on YouTube where the attention span is relatively short, you run the risk of having educated your audience on everything they need to know. And then they're just like, well, I got it all. Thanks. Like I'll move on. Right. Whereas if they feel attracted to you as a person, they may, might be more inclined to stick around for two, three, four, five years. Um, and, and that's something that I do fear a little bit on YouTube. It's like, I notice a lot of creators, uh, who, who are extremely successful will almost intentionally like spoon feed their audience. Like keep them in the dark, right? It's like they give them little tiny bits of knowledge with every video because if they came out with it all at once, they might realize just how simple it is and then be like, oh, well, that's all I got to do to get Jack. Like, you know, I'm good. All right. You know what I mean? So for me, I feel like the vlogs are a quintessential piece of my channel because I think that they contribute to the, the long game for me. Um, so that's sort of how I at the time justified this it's like you know this bit of irony it's like contributes to the personal element of it so on and so forth um but since then i've realized that like well if 150,000 people watch it or half that 75,000 people watch it it's just not worth the pushback for me so i just on my vlogs i just don't really clickbait them like that anymore yeah but i i think i just i just love that you you talked about it and that we're talking about it now because i think while we are in some ways, like Greg said, we have to play the game. We're beholden to the reality of what we need to do to help people. We can also be social critics to some degree and say, hey, maybe we should think about the way we consume information and what do we value. And I think that gives people the opportunity to reassess and perhaps recalibrate and not to like be too bold and say that we've had that much of an impact, but perhaps some of that and some of those shifts in values and awareness are why you guys have been able to be successful. So I think it's important to have some responsibility as a content creator to, sure, you don't want to go against your own brand, uh, and which is really just basically maintaining trust with the people who are listening to you. And I do think making personal connections with your audience, they want to be told a story, they want to understand why this is important, they want to connect with you. I, I totally agree with that. Um, and then you also want to not just try to follow what you need to do to produce content, but in some degree lead and say, hey, if, if, if we're valuing the wrong things and that's getting in the way of us getting better, then maybe I can spend some time talking about that. And I think that's just, I just, I just want to say I appreciate that, that, that that's a part of the, uh, what you guys have done. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's just really interesting that yeah. um, in many ways, you, you, even though you've established this huge, huge following, you feel like there's things you have to do, you know? And I think that's a, 
I think that's almost something that people don't quite realize. They think, oh, if you can get that snowball rolling down the hill, then you can do whatever you want. But the snowball doesn't roll if you don't play the game. Yeah. One other thing on the point of clickbait I just thought of was I feel like it, the, the only, I think, critique of it is that it kind of sets you up for a slippery slope. So like mm. at, at what point, you know, and everyone may have a different viewpoint on this and, and mine might be different from Greg's and Omar's and, you know, who, creator. Um, but I think that you have to have some line in the sand that you just don't cross. Like I, I kind of have one for myself. Um, you know, like I'll never modify my physique with Photoshop. Like I could easily do that. It's really tempting to like, just make the shoulders a little rounder on a shoulder video. It's like, well, it'll get more people in if my shoulders look a lot better, but like that just seems really unethical and has the potential to really backfire. Um, other things like there's just certain words that like, I just feel like are just not worth it. Like tone and like stuff like this. It's like, yeah, if I'm trying to reach a female audience, that word is great. And I'm tempted to use it because once you get in the video, you're going to figure out that what I mean by tone is fat loss, but it's still kind of like, it's just so cringy to me that yeah. it's just not worth it to do it. And so if someone was going to say, well, you know, you have Jeff, who's like, you got these like highly edited thumbnails, super high res physique pics of, from like one hand picked out of a hundred taken and the bold text and so on and so forth. Like it, it probably crosses that line in the sand uh, for them, right? So I feel like perhaps, you know, as a community, it might be important to have some sort of discussion about like where, where that lies. Like at what point does it start to not look academic to the point that like it almost doesn't matter what's in the videos anymore because that's going to be your public perception, you know? Mm -hmm. That's something that I think about a bit because I know that I flirt with that boundary probably more than anyone else here. So... Well, I, don't I, was, know. I, yeah, I haven't figured it out, but I, I think, as you said, though, Jeff, it depends on the intention and the type of information you're attempting to convey where someone that I don't know if Greg or uh, Eric knows this person, but Christian Guzman is his name, who has a very successful channel. And I actually think when it comes to vlogging, he does a very good job of how he organizes his videos, how he conveys that information. It's a personal journey, however. And so he's actually now infamous for his clickbait for the titles that he'll have. And so when you use a title like bad news, it seems counter to what your brand's about. But for someone like Christian Guzman and what he's about, that's just par for the course and people have come to expect that. So maybe almost, I don't want to say they expect more from you, but due to the nature of your content also influences people's expectations. Um, mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. do, I do want to shift uh, just quickly because I do have a question for Greg that I've been curious about. And it's, it's actually really interesting because... Words. Can, can, yeah. can, can I just comment on that last Shoot. topic of conversation? Jeff, I don't actually think you're particularly close to the line. Um, so I... I <laughs> That's, um, opens up Adobe. No, no, so, so, <laughs> Here's the line. Well, I, so I, I, think, I think that's like... I think that's another issue. When Greg um, says, well, actually, you know, shit's about to get real. That's how I know. <laughs> well, actually. Well, so I think, I think the, the main thing you want to preserve, right, is that uh, whatever you do, people don't cease to take you seriously and by extension cease to take seriously the information you're trying to provide to them, right? Um, and one of one of the channels that seems to be absolutely killing it is, uh, dang it, what's it called? Athlean X. Mm, yeah. um, and like, I haven't watched much of his stuff. I think it's kind of scaremongery but again i haven't watched much of it so that could be uh an incorrect read on the situation but like it, it seems like I, I don't think that guy like photoshops himself but he uses every other clickbait tactic in the books um but like when i see him being discussed on like reddit or on forums like there's a lot of people that just hold him up as like like the god of distilling pure information to the masses and so uh, it doesn't seem like he's crossed whatever that whatever like theoretical line that is, and I think you're like at least a solid two or three steps back from that line relative to him. Um, mm -hmm. So like like absolutely, I would certainly not recommend you do anything you don't personally feel comfortable with. But I also I also disagree that you're particularly close to that line. So like maybe with your current audience and what they've come to expect from you, you might be near that line. But like in a more fitness community general sense, I 
don't really think that's the case. Yeah, I, I almost never get it from my actual audience. Like, I, I'll, okay. um, I'll almost never get a comment saying like, oh, this is clickbait. But I just, you know, I'm, I'm aware of the feedback from, like I said, the militant evidence-based crowd. I'm calling them militant because they're against me, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's, there's a group of people who find it's too far. And so, you, you know, you hear the criticism louder than the praise, I suppose. Now, Jeff, I, I mean, there, there's that type of criticism, no matter who you are. Like I, yeah, fair. I, I get that style of criticism as well. And it's like, well, why do you have to like editorialize and give all of this background information? Like just, just share the article. And like, if your audience isn't dumb, they'll read it for themselves. <laughs> it's like my, my business is predicated on the idea that no one reads the articles for themselves. Like that, that's why I have a job. Yeah. It <laughs> so, sounds insane to me. So yeah, I mean like there's people who are going to be pissed about that regardless. Now, Greg, that's very cute how you try to divert and go off on a tangent. So I couldn't ask the question, but I'm coming right <laughs> back to you to make you uncomfortable. Don't think I don't know this, bro. Um, that is very <laughs> unCanadian of you, Omar. Oh, you, well, that's why I get accused all the time. It's like, Wait, are you from California? Like they they can't even they can't even suppose that I'm Canadian by the way I act, and I don't like it. <laughs> what I was gonna say is that whereas Jeff's content, where he gets more complex and he uh, gives the visuals and all that information, it makes sense then when he wants to transition. Uh, to making products or information where you go from you know a visual medium to perhaps the written word or a combination thereof so I get that transition and where he would go with you what was fascinating with me and observing this and just being along for part of that journey is the fact that the level of detail that you give with your articles the old adage and we've seen you know a fitness influencers writers through our time they give a little bit up front and then you got to mm -hmm. pay for more. You got to get the book, right? Like I'll give you an excerpt from my upcoming book. So I want to talk about the ketogenic diet. I'll give you chapter two, right? But if you want the rest of the chapters, you have to buy the book. And you went completely counter to that. And not only that, your business model is quite successful. So it's not like you gave it all up front and you're suffering as a result and people are just reading your articles and there's no way to support yourself. In fact, it supports your model. I'm just curious what your thought process was uh, behind that, where you wrote the definitive squat guide, the definitive uh, deadlift, bench press, which go into more detail than any other article. And for all intents and purposes, you could have packaged that up and sold it as a standalone product. You give more information than anyone else while still retaining a high level readership. And then what's further, people support you by buying either mass or the products, the other information you give out. So it seems almost counter to the traditional uh, marketing tactic of give something up front, but then leave them wanting more. You're like, here's all of it. P.S. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. I got some more stuff you want to learn. Like you give a lot up front. Can you explain the rationale? I know you said that you like to write for yourself and appeal to yourself and people follow along, but I, I think it's incredible. And to me, that's one of the most impressive feats. Oh man. Uh, so, so th the thought process from, from a business perspective is that, um, is that there's not one. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So like I, uh, I'm not like a very materialistic person. And no. so like for me, as long as I'm making enough money that like, I'm not going to wind up living under a bridge somewhere. Um, like, could I optimize things further to make more money? Oh, absolutely. I could like, that's not a question. Um, but it's also like, I just don't need to, uh, cause I, I make more than I feel like I need. And so like, I'm content with that. Uh, so I'm not necessarily recommending people try to follow my business model. If you're trying to, uh, you know, make the Forbes list or something like that. Um, but yeah, so it, it, it has worked out, uh, it has worked out better than I expected it to. Yeah. Um, so my thought process is more like, um, I, I tend to just like buy stuff from brands that I generally like and support, um, regardless of what it is kind of sight unseen just to support their work. Um, like I donate to several pages on Patreon and never really go to like the subscriber portal. I, I think there's like maybe some perks that subscribers get, but it's more like, you know, I, I like the work you're doing. I want to support it. Um, and so I guess that's like kind of my business model. Um, 
like I don't have a Patreon, but it's more just I kind of assume that if I give away tremendous value for free, then when I put stuff out, um, it's not going to be like identical to the stuff that has been covered for free. Like it is, uh, it is additional value that people are then paying for. Um, but, you know, I just assume that like if if people like me and appreciate the information I've provided to them in the past, yeah, some of them will buy it hopefully. Um, and so far they have. What and I'll, I'll go as far to say, Greg, that I think even though there may, may have not been intention behind that, um, that's the same way I think. And that was born out of my early experience as a personal trainer and running up against uh, PT managers who wanted me to re-sign clients no matter what. And me arguing with them to say, hey, and this is we're talking like 2005, 6, and 7. So mm -hmm. social media marketing, online training wasn't really a thing yet. And me saying, hey, look, we want people to come in here, have a great experience, change their lives and go out there and be our marketing team, not for us to string them along until all they want to say about us is negative stuff and poison the well because we have a limited geographical area. Like we're in mm -hmm. California and we're a gym, like there's plenty of us. And just having these not like long dragged out month long arguments with PT managers. And I, I brought that into uh, my my, my business, and, and I've done the same thing as you have. I've put out tons of free content, and I was blown away by the fact people wanted to buy my books because they could pull from all the extant parts of, of, of the Internet and put it together. But I think, one, there's a difference between the kind of a scarcity and a abundance mindset. Mm -hmm. Like the whole idea of don't give them everything, leave something and hold it back, it's almost like assumes like you got stranded on a ship with the, the the hundred people and they're the last hundred people on 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 the, on the earth and some of them want to do fitness right so you've got to make it to the rest of yeah, your life yeah. where they'll they'll trade shit with you if you give them fitness advice when in reality there's a new person who starts lifting every day and mm -hmm. um and even though the content might not necessarily grow old people don't want to watch videos from 2011 and honestly, man, when I look back, they're like, oh, the quality is so bad, or I could have done this better. There's new ways not only to, not only is there sometimes useful new science information, please subscribe to Mass, but there's also sometimes better ways of communicating it, or you become a better communicator so you can do it better. That's why there's a second edition of the pyramids, you know, that kind of thing. So I think, despite it just being really your personality, I think it does actually line up with what makes sense from the realities of the industry we're in, which is service, you know, not not selling shoes or something like that. Well, mm -hmm. Omar sells shoes, but I mean, I, premium I think, I think weightlifting shoes. <laughs> I, I think yes. some of it is artisanal. Well, I, I think some of it as well with like selling a product is people, people to some degree are, are paying for the convenience of not having to put everything together themselves. So like yes. with the pyramids books, like the stuff in there, you ha you have written in articles elsewhere, you've said in videos elsewhere, but like when people buy those books, then it's like laid out sequentially. One thing builds on the next. Um, there there's there's a difference between ha like having a lot of finite bits of information in your head and knowing how to like co cohesively put that together into a model that's that's going to help inform your training. You know. Um, well said. And so that is not so much with mass. So mass is a different thing, but as far as like books go, um, we may put together a course at some point. Um, it, it's it, that type of stuff is more about like, there may be some new information, but there's not going to be a ton of new information. Uh, there's not, there's not really much new information under the sun really. Um, but it's more about like showing how all of that fits together and taking all of those like disparate pieces of information and putting it together into something more cohesive and usable. Um, so I think I think that's the main thing people are paying for with products. I agree. I agree, Jeff. And, and also, like, some of it's like just time and convenience as well. So if if someone wants to know everything Eric Helms thinks about programming, like how many pages of Google are you going to have to scroll through? Like how many Google searches are you going to have to do? How many hours of content are you going to have to read? And then how long are you going to have to think about it to put that all together for yourself versus like, I don't know how much are your books? They are for the bundle for the low, low, low price, price of $69 and lifetime updates. 
Is it seriously cool. sixty nine dollars? I think sixty seven. Sixty seven. That's the right number. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, that's a that's a mistake. Um, that's a mistake. But, but yeah, so that's your first so mistake. basically, so basically, like that entire process I described. If you think that it would take you seven hours to do that, and you value your time at more than ten dollars an hour, it makes more sense just to buy the books. You know. Um, so yeah, that, that's the way I see it. Like, it, and people pay for convenience, and I think products tend to be more convenient than just trying to piece together content from all over. For sure. What what, are, what is your guys' take on sponsorship? So like, uh, you know, I have two or three ongoing sponsorships, and then I do standoff sponsorships for products as well. Do they have a? Do they fit in the community? Are they okay? <laughs> Jeff's, some... Jeff's coming to the militant crew to say, like, is it okay, guys? Well, what, I, I don't want to preface, I don't, to I don't do? preface my opinion on yeah. it too much because I want to know what you really think, you know? I, so I, I like I, I, should, were... I, shouldn't have, I shouldn't have even said that I do these because I, I want to I know what you actually were, think. I liked when you were promoting the body wraps. Uh, I think that's a very important and effective product. Uh, the fit tee, I'm a little bit less sold on. The frog. Um, what do you think about the frog? Got right. Brandon. Brandon, take this out in post processing. You're gonna hate. You're gonna hate. You're gonna hate the shake weight. The shake weight. Then. Yeah. So. Dude, do you remember? Uh, do you remember? Dang it! What's his name again? Um, Mike Chang. We were talking about him before. Mike O'Hearn. Yeah. Oh, the yeah. like quail. The like quail egg supplements he sold for like seven hundred dollars a month. <laughs> you said. You said pre-recording. You liked that guy. <laughs> Oh, I, oh, I, I liked him. I liked him for a different set of reasons, <laughs> <laughs> not for his sponsorships. Not, but not I, for I think that's a, positions. I think that's a really good question, though, Jeff. I mean, the that now we're talking about not only um, are we skirting some lines theoretically. I don't think any of us really really do with trying to get uh, maximizing viewership for an altruistic reason and that potential slippery slope and. You know, the whole utilitarian philosophy, we got to think about second order and third order effects. And is the the means to an end actually betraying our final goal? And that's a, a question you constantly have to ask yourself. I think where that line in the sand is drawn is going to be different depending on who you are and what you're doing. And if you want to talk in marketing parlance, you're a quote unquote brand. I think for sponsorships, the same thing is true as well. So, for example, I'm a science communicator, but I'm also a scientist. So one thing I don't do is I don't take any money from supplement companies, uh, regardless of whether I personally would, uh, would let that bias my research consciously. I don't want the perception because then it can hurt my ability to communicate science. They might think I have a bias in, in what I talk about. Um, but will I you know, sell a research review? Of course, because that perfectly aligns with my brand. If, if you want to get in-depth uh, my, my specific Thoughts on specific studies, for sure. Will I sell books? Absolutely, because it's not a, it's not a, any way a brand betrayal. Because I'm saying, okay, look, I'm a science communicator. Here's my thoughts on all the science I've communicated to create a system. And I think, depending on who you are, what you do, and where you're positioned in the industry, there's nothing wrong with an athlete saying, no, I really do think this is one of the better supplement companies. I do use their stuff, and I was using it before I even got the, the sponsorship. They came to me. However, I think if, if, if I think the decisions is based on who's going to pay me the most and, you know, what, what's going to give me the biggest return on investment, then when we're talking about something that's supposedly supposed to help someone else and you, that's your brand statement, that does conflict. So I think it comes down to the uh, who you are, what your goal is, how you're positioning yourself, what your role is, and then is, is it, is it, uh, does it have an ethical boundary and integrity crossed or not? Mm -hmm. I, my, I think my, my favorite video that I've I think I've seen in like a year is Omar's I forget what even water it was now you did a no oh, what, you did Pelican a spot go Sam Pelican, so, dude, that video is so I've watched that like a hundred times and I laugh every single time it's so funny there's a I don't know how you can keep a straight it's face it's it seems so real like I, it's just yeah. amazing it's uh so <laughs> I, I would say jeff once again uh to give you a compliment and i think it is different in the a blogging space where as a youtuber you have somewhat you have a brand a personal identity that people then want to follow along some of the sponsorships that you might get would be a little different so i know uh, jeff for you you have uh, squarespace which isn't one-to-one -one fitness related but it is congruent with your 
fitness brand and your brand identity. So it makes a lot of sense. I think the nuance of what Eric's talking about is something every communicator or anyone that's on social media or wants to develop a brand has to think about what they're willing and not willing to do. <laughs> something that actually recently I had a conversation with Eric, which at first seemed that it would be fine, is I was offered uh, to be paid to go to Shazam the movie, the premiere, just to attend it, uh, get paid, you know, I'll say several thousand dollars, just take a photo with like the actor and say hashtag ad. And you de you declare it's an ad. So on Instagram, you declare that it's an ad, but take a photo and you get paid several thousand dollars. But to go back to kind of Greg's point, already the level of compensation I'm getting for what I do, I feel is more than adequate. So adding that additional income source, it's not necessary for me. And I think overall, I don't, I didn't have actually quite a ethical problem with it because I think, you know, seeing a movie and declaring not that you like it, but just going in that space is fine. You're, you know, documenting your experience, but I just thought it was a little corny. And so when deciding what is congruent with your brand and not, you just have to decide what that means. And so, um, I like to try and build either products. That's what we joked about the weightlifting shoe company. I used it for four years before I approached the owner, Neil, because Neil was just talking to me a little bit. I said, well, how would I buy into this company? I like, I like it a lot. So rather than be endorsed, own something you believe in, but the things that I do try and endorse are the ones that are most congruent with the brand. So NASM, I had, I think eight ads with it. So uh, a personal training certification, I'm like, yes, do I, do I think you being certified versus not being certified would be useful? Yeah, so I, I agree with it. But I think for you, Jeff, for anyone here, I think everyone is, uh, you know, following their own uh, ethics. And so that's not a, a concern. But for everyone out there that we see, it does become a concern when we talked about Michael Hearn, that wasn't a sponsorship, but the quail eggs were at several hundred dollars that he was charging for those eggs. And oh, and longevity, when you talked about longevity, uh, Jeff, you wanting to be in the game for a long time, I think keeping your moral compass whatever however you define that and your brand identity is important for long-term success because when you sell out and that's basically what happened to mike chang uh that guy a uh, six-pack shortcuts who didn't even own six-pack shortcuts and most people don't know that he was just the front of it um but how he got booted off he he did so much shit over time sponsorships just crap all the marketing that finally people got tired of him you know mm -hmm. yeah i i think for me, I, I've never gotten really almost no pushback and I've done a, quite a lot of sponsorship. Like it's probably my biggest income source, honestly. Um, so I think that for whatever reason, my audience just sees me as a content creator influencer and that's just par for the course sort of thing um, on the platform. Um, it was like, I listened to, uh, an interview with Joe Rogan and Sam Harris. I don't know if you, any of you guys follow either of those guys, but it's Sam is like a public intellectual and Joe is like a comedian podcaster, right? And Sam was kind of like, you know, you can say something on air that sounds really dumb and people will just be like, oh, well, you know, I'm just a comedian. So like, that's your way out, right? Whereas like, if Sam were to say something dumb on air, it's like gonna derail his career potentially, right? So it's like, I feel like depending on your position in the community, there's there's like a, a spectrum of things you can get away with. Um, but still, I still worry that like, you know, if I'm, take, just take Squarespace for an example, right? I've used Squarespace since I think 2014 or 2015. So that's a long time to run yeah. my website, right? Um, and they offer me a good deal. They don't interfere with the content whatsoever. It's not fitness related, but I do use it. And I feel like if you're gonna do a website, it's the best there is. It's perfect for e-commerce, everything, whatever. Um, so if they're gonna offer, if they're gonna be, I don't have a Patreon or anything. So like if they're gonna pay me basically and support this content, then yeah, it makes sense for me to do that. But still, I worry that people, you know, is, is Squarespace necessarily the best for you? Like, I don't know if it's true for absolutely everyone, right? Um, and there are obviously uh, competitors and there's like, everyone knows that this, I wouldn't be saying this if I wasn't being paid. So it kind of like opens up the door to mistrust for some people, I think, right? There's that, at least that mm. possibility. Like for us, like the four of us, we know how the game works and it's like, eh, you know what? You're still ethical, you still have good content, so on and so forth. But I feel like, anything that opens up the door to distrust is potentially harmful over the long run. So it's like, 
I clearly have other ways of making money and producing these videos. And like, I don't need to rely on sponsorship. It's just like, well, that's basically my way of getting paid for doing that Saturday video or whatever. Right. So I, I guess I would just be curious what your opinion would be on the distrust factor that's able to kind of creep in. It's like, you know, okay, I do the Squarespace thing. Then I do, you know, uh, such and such a thing and then I do a watch thing and then I do you know another thing and it's like at what point does it get to be like eh, I don't know if I can trust the science stuff anymore because it sounds like he's only doing it he's doing what's in his best interest in a way right well let me let me tell you what I think Jeff I think um because it's not content it's it's unrelated to your content if it's a watch or if it's a website generator it's it, it sits outside of your Venn diagram in many ways you know, um, the problem and where that distrust factor, I think, becomes an issue is when it does start to cross those intersecting lines, like you're hard out on a supplement company or a specific like that. That's where people they don't know. Um, but I think I think people do see it the same way as Patreon, like you being sponsored by a website. Like now, if you were a programmer or if you were like teaching a master class on setting up websites, that'd be a huge conflict of interest. Right. Um, and that would be a problem. But since you're not, I think the majority of rational people are probably going to see it the same way you saw it when you made the decision to say, hey, this, this guy, you know, like YouTube doesn't pay you that much directly. And we, I want to keep seeing high quality videos and stuff that's really informing me and helping me and helping other people. So that's great. I'm glad he has an income source. Um, and no, it's not Patreon, but it, I think people see it the same way. And it's not until, like, like Omar decided not to do the Marvel thing, um, but I think he would have been fine if he did, you know? Um, because there's, like, like what is that going to say? Like, oh, I can't trust his, his fitness his information because... Movies. Yeah, Shit. actually, sorry. Because I like Marvel and now he's on a DC movie. I'm out of here. Like, like screw Shazam. He should have done that for Captain Marvel. You know, like I, I can't think of many arguments of why that would be a problem. Coach, I, I think. Yeah. Go ahead, Greg. I, I think I think one of the things to consider is like, uh, when you take on a sponsor, are you ever going to have to make the choice between either like potentially breaking your contract or like being in a position where you're like expected to defend something you would otherwise not defend? Mm -hmm. Um. So for, for something like Squarespace, uh, I think that's generally as inoffensive as they come. Like you're not, you're never going to go over to like the Squarespace Instagram account and they're like tweeting swastikas, you know, like that's, <laughs> and, and I, I if just If you're going to design a swastika, Square, yeah, Squarespace. Like if, <laughs> if you're, if you're trying, if you're trying to build a white nationalist movement <laughs> in your country, build it beautiful on Squarespace. Like mm -hmm. I, I just, I don't I think you're going to totally... see should have picked a sponsor that I have a commission code for. This is just, <laughs> <laughs> like, that, that's, it's salary based with them. This is ridiculous. So, so yeah, like I, I think, um, I think so with something like if you're being sponsored by another fitness brand, like a supplement company or something like that. Uh, one of the reasons that I personally haven't gone down that route, uh, is like fitness people, even like otherwise generally okay. Fitness people often say dumb shit. And I don't want to be in a position where someone says like, hey, your sponsor who generally puts out good information and supports good stuff said this really stupid thing. How do you feel about that? Because like on one hand, you're like, OK, like this is a generally decent sponsor. I don't want to throw them under the bus. Uh, but you also don't want to defend something you otherwise want to defend. And so with mm -hmm. something like Squarespace, I don't think you're ever going to wind up in a situation like that. Um but anything fitness related, uh, I've personally just drawn that line and said, like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Um, and I don't think that that's like a bad idea either. I do want to say uh, to mention something that Eric talked about. I think there is a little bit of nuance. The larger you become uh, as a channel where there's a little bit of a depersonalization where you're no longer an individual, but a brand. And so it's easier to attack an individual. What happened? I'm going to get the facts wrong the uh, but the gist of it is essentially <laughs> the gist is that i think it was philip defranco i just don't know which youtuber it was but he was endorsed by something that seemed relatively congruent uh, this individual had some mental health issues and it was similar to the website does anyone know let's get checked it's something where you could do tests for oh, yeah. scd's uh, health markers 
Yeah. It was uh, better help, right? The, great, bro. How are you getting your masters? Uh, or no, PhD? Is it PhD? Masters. 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 And you and you know uh, the juicy gossip of YouTube better than me. Yeah, better health. Go on. Oh, that's oh, that's that, it. I I, okay. I don't know any details okay. about it. I just uh, yeah. So the, the, the I gist. hear things and they stick. <laughs> so the gist of it is that this individual who had some mental health issues took on a sponsorship from this company called Better Health, and it seemed like everything was fine. He was talking about how he had these issues, and Better Health is a way that you can communicate with an expert or someone in that field to talk about your specific issues. But when certain individuals, because this is a big influencer started examining the company, they noticed various cracks and uh, various ethical issues. And so seemingly it seemed that the uh, website or the company was fine, but upon further investigation, it was actually pretty problematic. And so this person had a huge controver uh, controversy as a result of that. And I don't think anyone here is gonna face something similar, but I think the larger you become as an influencer, the more people kind of want to attack you. You know, when, when you talk to Jeff about that negative reinforcement with some of the titles, I think the larger you are, there is a certain level of either jealousy or trolling that exists on YouTube and the internet by and large so that every single sponsorship is under larger scrutiny the bigger you become. So it might work for a certain threshold, but once you become bigger, then all eyes are on you. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think... I'm on the same page as you there for sure. Yeah. yeah. Eric's just like you young kids, <laughs> like with your Instagram. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> we, and you're in your thirties too, mister. Yeah. So you watch yeah. that young kids language, mm. sir. Mm. You're on the other side of the three zero. Cross so, that boundary. Uh, so, so Jeff, what, what are your thoughts then? Cause I, I noticed you prefaced yeah. this with, I don't want to inject my thoughts. I want to get your guys genuine thoughts, but where, where do you see this whole concept of sponsorship? What sponsorship that? are you thinking about buddy? <laughs> Open up. Well, I, I, well, I do need to be careful. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. Because I do have contracts, but I, I think my biggest concern is, actually, I hadn't concerned, thought too much about what Greg had to say because I generally don't take anything on that I hadn't already been using or like am not convinced or have heard so many testimonials, whatever. So it's like I, I'm pretty sure they're going to be okay. And I feel like if there was a big public eruption, like what happened to Philip DeFranco, it would be like a flash in the pan. Like I, I've had these controversies and they just like they come and go quite quickly as long as you as long as you stay true to your values i think that those sorts of things but but then again you know it depends on the severity of it and it depends on how much you're associated with it but the solution for me would be if a sponsor you know tweeted swastikas i would just drop it immediately and it's like okay that's fine my audience would understand right so that's not so much the concern it's it's more so the concern that uh people you know it's that people are gonna develop a lack of trust. Like it's just not consistent with the content that I put out. I want it to be as unbiased as possible. And so maybe for me, there may be certain sponsorships that I'd be better off saying, you know what, like I'm gonna let this go. It's gonna be a big hit to my income. How about I, I start a Patreon? Or how about I do you know, something else or, or what have you? And um, that's just something I toy around with in my head. So your guys' feedback was helpful, but as a individual, as a business person, it's like, those decisions are kind of things you can't just like uh, make a quick assessment on because there's so many like layered complexities to it, especially past a certain point. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I think that, you know, for maybe to make it more actionable for the listeners, I feel like one, one, as you start to grow and, and so on and so forth, and you start to get these opportunities, I think that, you know, Eric talked about like having a mission statement, having a, a set of values, like if it, doesn't plug into that or you, you know actually think about it down the road like greg said like if if down the road there's the potential for this to eventually bite you and and you have other sources of income or maybe you can think of other sources like create a product do it do it yourself or what have you uh then that might be a better better route so you don't get into that gray area too much i mean when in doubt you could just push your mass affiliate link a little bit harder <laughs> Fair. J just my two cents. Fair. What, uh, Greg, what you, you didn't you, know. You know, I, you I'll, know. Actually, yeah. I'll actually co-sign on that. I think that's, a, that, that's, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> no, Greg. Jeff was thinking of dropping you guys, I, actually. I, that's why he brought yeah, it up. That's, it's so weird. That's the, unna that's the unnamed sponsor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, no, uh, I agree. I'd love to push it more, and I feel like uh, I'd love to do more mass-related stuff. I, I pull from it all the time, but... I could plug it harder. 
I, I, I love I, I like, you just said I like that. What I'm we were, right now. <laughs> yeah, we were both totally kidding, and and the Canadian wins out again. I love it. Yeah. Well, here's the cool thing. Like, I I go to a nice few fitness expos, and people wait in line for a while to to meet me there, and there'll be, you know, people who there's this one guy I remember from the Arnold Classic last month uh, who, uh, or was that this month? It was this month. Anyway. Um, so many expos, so many lines. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. many people. And, too, too many and, adoring fans. And, well, it, the crazy thing is that he, he was like, dude, like, I love the science-based content that you do. I hated science in school. Like, I hated school in general. I have no interest in pursuing anything. But I read every issue of Mass, and I, like, absolutely love your content. And it's like, I think that it's really cool that you guys are able to reach people who have no science background and have them enjoy the content because it is really, I think, has like a really academic flavor to it. But yet it still is consumable by people um, in, in just the general public. So and the reason I said that is that like that was the, really the only thing that he wanted to, to say to me is like, thank him for thank me for basically introducing him to that to as a resource and, and so on. So it makes it it makes a cool. big, big impact on, on people outside of just the people who are maybe like nerding out or what have you. Like it really does reach the um, general as well. Thank, thanks thanks cool for letting us know that. Yeah. Yeah, that is really uh, cool to hear. So scintillating hot take alert. <laughs> um, I think most people are really into science. Uh, I think that, I think that like academic publishing is a disgustingly gate kept system. And so, so some things like if we're talking like, I don't know, quantum physics or something like, I feel like that shit's just going to be complicated because there's a lot of math and a lot of people don't like math that much. So like, whatever, like that's probably not going to be accessible by too many people, but like exercise science, come on, man. Like mm. for the most part, we're just like having people do some squats and then see like, oh, did they get stronger? Like it's, it's not most of the stuff in our field isn't that complicated. And, um, I feel like the vast majority of the research could be written in such a way that it would be accessible and enjoyable to read for a much, much, much wider audience without actually losing any of the actual information and nuance and the, the norms of writing within science, I think are just kind of ingrained at this point, but I think kind of developed into what they are to keep people out of the cool kids club where there's like a given level of understanding you have to have to, to read the stuff and understand it. Um, so like everyone inside the club gets it and it's hard to like, it's hard for someone outside the club to really understand what's going on. Um, Cause I like, like there have been, there've been like half a dozen articles on my site that are that are science like they're not just like study reviews or something like that or talking about some scientific topic like you know it's straight up like i went out and collected some data and like here's what i found yeah so you know not like the stuff i normally write where um you know so a couple of them were essentially like open source meta-analyses some of it was based off uh survey data from uh like looking at injuries from a survey i sent out a couple years ago um but, like, it contains all of the stuff that would be in a scientific publication. So there's, like, justification for why I'm writing it. Uh, there's the methods. There's the actual results. There's my interpretation of those results. Uh, all sources cited, et cetera. Um, but, like, written in the way that I write stuff. Um, so, you know, I could, I could probably take some of that and just, like, jargonify it and submit it to a journal somewhere. Um, but, like you know, then it's going to be read by the, I, I saw a statistic that the, the average um, academic or the average journal article is read by uh, about 2.4 people. Um, so, you know, it's, it's either like have that information generally meet that fate or, you know, get it out to a hundred thousand people. Um, yeah, yeah. And so like what I've seen is like, there is an appetite for the information there's just not an appetite for like the language and presentation used in academic writing. No, I, I totally agree, Greg. And I think both you and Jeff 
uh, are evidence that the appetite exists and that it's growing and that it has much more to do with how it was presented rather than the content itself. Um, and I think that starts in, in, in grade school. You know, uh, there's largely two reasons, in my opinion, that someone wouldn't want to engage with science. One is just a lack of personal interest in that type of science. Like, for example, my wife is loves earth science, uh, volcanoes, sediments, all that stuff. She's all about it. And that's just something that's not going to be interesting for me. And then vice versa with the level of detail, I go into nutrition and exercise and coaching psychology. And that's, that, that's just the way it is. But um, we also get presented science in a certain way in high school. Like the first time I was presented with earth science or biology or all of this was taught in such a pedag pedagogical fashion and presented then in, in university level through journal articles that it can easily make someone think, I don't like any science, like the way science is done is something that I don't like. And then they can hold that truth in their head and believe it, but then watch Bill Nye the Science Guy or watch NGT or watch any one of these uh, you know, shows like uh, documentaries about science and go, this is awesome. And I think that's what you guys have both done a really good job of hooking into is the intrigue and curiosity for science, but then finding ways of delivering it uh, that that are more al in alignment with, with that curiosity rather than kind of some kind of stuffy delivery. So I just want to thank you both for doing that and also for sharing a lot of the, the methods and, and the thought processes that have gone into that. Um, and I think maybe we could, we could ask you both for any kind of closing remarks before then we find out where people can find you and learn more about you. That was the nicest way, Eric, of kicking our guests off. I saw what you did there. It's like, just start there. And then it's like, do you have any closing comments, guys? <laughs> I'm just hustling out the door with kindness. <laughs> All right, Jeff, you're going first this time and, and you can't force me to make it otherwise. Well, you, you just defeated your own purpose. Oh, I'm not trying to be polite. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm here getting what I want, and what I want is for you to go first. Um, <clears throat> there was something I was going to say about that. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys uh, watch Friends, but, like, y who is the paleontologist on that show? Is it uh, – do you, do you guys watch – the show Friends, Ross. Was, I think Ross was that? the paleontologist. Ross. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, he used to get trolled for being like a science nerd. And like watching it now, it seems so outdated because I feel like if you like made fun of someone for being a science nerd now, you just kind of look like an idiot. You know what I mean? And I think that that like really does show how the culture has shifted towards it being much cooler. Not only in that example, but I, I found that interesting. Um, it just makes it seem so dated if, if you were to watch it and be like, oh, it's kind of weird that they'd make fun of him for being like a nerd in the lab or whatever. Um, what was I going to say? There, there was actually a question I, I was wanting to ask you. I, hopefully it doesn't open up too much of a can of worms. I don't know. I know Greg is uh, Go for it, Jeff. Let's light do on it. sleep. <laughs> oh, I'm, so, I'm good. I'm good. Are you guys good? Because this is it, it's going to get long, but like I have nothing else planned for the evening. So I was going to I was going to ask you a question. Yeah. Um, since we're all here, you know, and and if if you want to play the alg if you want to play the frequency game, this could begin episode two or something, you know. Um, I got forty. I got forty two <laughs> minutes on my recorder, bro. So I'm good to go. <laughs> we got it. So you go ahead, Jeff. <clears throat> so like, since I've reached more of the general public, I don't get this a lot, but probably once a video, I'll get someone who will be like, "Why are you trying to?" over science this like you're making it way too complicated like do you think arnold really cared about science like he just went in and trained hard and it's always arnold who's the example um and i'm curious what you guys how you guys would respond to that like i, I don't usually actually respond but like i always go over it, it kind of in my head and collect my thoughts on it and what do you what do you think of that Be and, and i won't share my own opinion because i'm really kind of curious what you how you feel about that i get that a lot too and yeah. i think that's probably because along with with greg we're we're pretty heavy sciencey dudes um i i think that is just a basic misunderstanding of perhaps what my purpose is what my interests are and the way i operate in my head like i think people forget like i'm a freaking bro like i love arnold i watched pumping iron more times than i probably should have and i they're not in opposition so when i respond to someone like that i i, I normally say Hey, dude, like, 
I'm all about just getting in, getting after it, and getting it done. And yeah, progressive overload and hard work and consistency is 90% of it for sure. But I'm also a science nerd, and I got a lot of my followers who are too. So if they, that's not your jam, like, all good. Like, fist bump and carry on. But, like, you know, I'm going to keep doing the science nerd thing. And it's not that I think this is a requirement for you. I think that's... I think it's because people are so conditioned to think that the influencer is going to tell them that you have to follow my system, my beliefs, and do my thing, and it's the only pathway forward, that they assume that you're saying, hey, science is cool, that if you're not doing science, you're leaving gains on the table, you know, you're not going to be a world champion, and this is the only pathway forward. So I see it as an opportunity to tell someone, it's not really what I'm about, it's not really the way it works, and you can like Arnold and science at the same time. Yeah, for for me, like, I get that question a fair amount. Um, the way that I always answer it is, so so one, I think that, I think something that's very discounted is just learning for its own sake. Um, I think that a lot of people in today's world are uh, very focused on, like, efficiency. That, like, if you're doing something that's not, uh, a clearly defined leisure activity, um, you should be doing something productive. Um, and productive productivity kind of roughly defined as like something that could possibly benefit you and get you ahead. Um, and so like, I think that mindset is pretty pervasive and discounts the value of just learning things for the love of learning them. Um, so like I follow uh, a couple like practical engineering channels on YouTube and like, I'm not an engineer. I'm never going to be an engineer, but like just, just knowing how a bridge works. Uh, I mean, I, the basics are simple, but like what actually goes into constructing a bridge that is going to allow millions of cars to drive over it without collapsing. Um, just like random stuff like that, like ways that you construct cities so that sinkholes don't develop. Like I'm never going to use that in my life. I just think it's cool to know. Mm. Um, so I think on, and even for like fitness related stuff. So I went on a kick one time and spent like two weeks reading about um, like various signaling pathways in adipose tissue beyond just stuff like, you know, what causes lipolysis during exercise and whatnot. Uh, and I'm like, I'm never going to use that. Uh, I probably would have no, it, it's not even within my scope of practice to apply that information unless I was like an endocrinologist, which I'm not and will never be. But like, I just think it's cool. So, uh, so one, I don't, I think that the, the basic drive is antithetical to a drive to like, just elevate yourself and be a well-rounded person and who, kn who knows things just for the sake of doing so. Two, um, on a more practical level, I think there's kind of like the 80-20 rule going on where just the very, very basic stuff uh, is going to get the majority of gains for the majority of people. But then uh, most people aren't perfectly average in every conceivable dimension and so for you, you may have like a few little problems that if you knew more about stuff, you'd be able to better troubleshoot those things, get better results for yourself. If you're a coach, most of your clients are going to be pretty straightforward. Um, like the basics work, they have always worked and they will always work. Um, but you're going to have some clients that are just kind of weird and atypical. And the more you know and the more tools you have in your tool belt, the better job you're going to be able to do with those people. So, uh, yeah, like you, you, you really don't need to know that much to probably do a pretty good job. Um, but then, you know, for those uncommon situations, for those uncommon clients, uh, you're just going to be taking shots in the dark unless you do know more and know stuff in more depth. I, I just respond yeah. that Arnold uh, did not deserve to win the 1980 Mr. Olympia, so I don't deserve, I, I don't believe in supporting those individuals. Frank Zane was robbed, you know, so. <laughs> nah, it's Chris Dickerson. Oh, oh, of course. Zane, Zane was a little past his prime as much as I love the guy. Really? Man. I, that's I, why I, can't, that's I, why I can't joke about bodybuilding in front of Eric. <laughs> I, I love the history stuff that you're doing. That's like a, an avenue that I feel like is so cool and unique apart from 
the science of it and then just like the bro side of it. It's like this history thing adds such a new element that I had never really explored before. It's it's so interesting. Oh, great. I'd love to see I'd love to see more of that. I'd actually love to Uh oh. We, we're, we should we're, collaborate on something. Eric, we should. We would love I, I mean, to. I mean, in a video. If you're try, thinking of entering our space and dominating now our fledgling niche market, we're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's an interesting idea. Oh, Actually, so wait oh, a uh, I, I need to tell you about a new podcast that I'm starting with Jeff. It's called Iron History. Oh, Greg, um, what are you doing? Would you like to? I uh, just don't have enough time to do the Iron Culture <laughs> thing anymore. Ow, <laughs> big lead. I see how it operates. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It, I think that's I come, I come out with a research review also. It's just called Ass <laughs> <laughs> Applications oh, wow. and Strength Sport. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I, I think that's more pervasive, uh, uh, Jeff, on YouTube, however, where it's like the appeal to the biggest bro. Like, if it worked for Arnold, if, if he was able to, why should I even listen to you if he's the greatest bodybuilder of all time? Um, yeah. And yeah, it's, it, 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 I wouldn't say it's disheartening. I actually think the overall fitness IQ has gone up over the last mm -hmm. uh, seven years, as uh, we kind of spoke about. Seven years ago, would someone even know the concept of flexible dieting or the need or, or importance of strength training for natural lifters? Just a variety of different things. So I think that's gradually going away. I remember seven years ago now, uh, eight years ago actually, when I was uh, throwing up deadlift videos on YouTube and all the comments from new people, because you see Jeff, like, you know, your subscribers and then new viewers visiting you. Yeah. And 60% were new visitors. And the, what are you doing? Like, you're going to snap your back. I'm like, just this and that. And so just the shift that's happened over time, unfortunately, there's still some of that uh, that stays. And we'll, and we'll stay no matter what. I think uh, it was uh, Saul uh, Orwell, uh, who uh, owns examine.com, I read on his uh, uh, Facebook where it's like something like 2.4 percent of americans believe the earth is flat something like that some some absurd 2.4 percent too much um oh i i think it's more than that yeah. i saw a, was... i saw an absolutely ridiculous survey that split it out by by age groups right uh and i'm probably going to get this number wrong but it's not by much yeah. so uh of of people of people like in the millennial generation um some something like uh 70 like 70 to 80 percent of us uh claimed to be sure that the earth is round and then the other 20 percent is like think so but not quite sure all the way to i believe the earth is flat for the generation below us so people like 20 i think like 14 to 25 yeah. and maybe they maybe they were just trolling <laughs> answering this question but only something like 60% of them no. said that they were sure the earth is round. Um, I, I think it was like that. And then 20%, uh, it's like, I think it's round, but I'm not quite sure. And then 10% of, I really just have no idea. And then like 10% just straight up flat earthers. Wow. So, so like, I, I hope, I hope they were trolling, but like, let's I really found that hope. deeply concerning. Now we know let's why say, you're learning about bridges and city planning, Greg, for when the apocalypse happens, you're like, I'm just going to start. And we just spin off the edge. <laughs> yeah. But I think, um, I think that's, that's actually a, I also hope they're trolling, but B, it does speak to the points you guys have made about how important the way you package information is, because if there are some people spreading misinformation with great marketing and great ability to to, to kind of get inside your head you can be riddled with misinformation um, which is why it's so important that science communicators really do upskill and pay attention to the example you guys have set to make sure that their blogs are read to make sure their videos are watched so perhaps not half of 15 year olds think that we live on a disc because that seems like a problem so so yeah I really appreciate what you guys do I guess is what I'm saying and round second attempt here. Thank you guys so much for sharing that with us. <laughs> and uh, and Jeff, you first. Where, where can people find you? Uh, YouTube is probably the best spot. That's where I invest most of my time and energy. So if you just search Jeff Nippert on YouTube, you'll find my full catalog there. It's it's weird that awesome. you ask him to shout himself out, Eric, because the title of this episode, if I learned anything from Jeff from this one, is the Jeff Nep uh, Nippert episode. That's just what we're going to call it. So. 100 percent yeah no we got to call it the, the greg and jeff episode i remember i got you boy I remember, yeah. <laughs> I, I remember what you said greg yep greg how about you buddy uh i probably spend most of my time and effort in the basement of fetzer hall at the university of north carolina <laughs> chapel hill 
So uh, <laughs> you can find me there. <laughs> no, don't don't come. Um, so so find you have me enough participants is what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I've hit my recruitment threshold. Everyone else stay away. Awesome. Um, Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Uh, no, you can you can check out my stuff at strongerbyscience.com. Um, I'm reasonably active on Facebook, more so personal account than business account. Uh, and I'm also at Greg Knuckles on Instagram. Shout out to myself. Hit 50,000 followers today. So Ooh. I think that's kind of a big deal. Um, I realize that that probably makes me like the lowest subscriber count here on this podcast by an order of magnitude. Um, but I'm I'm going to pat myself on the back and not figure out how to end this statement and stop. <laughs> Excellent work. Well, don't worry. Omar is the master of ending statements and podcasts. So why don't you give us that beautiful outro, my friend? Well, before I do that, I want to thank you guys once again, because it has been very cool to see both of you guys find your niche, grow and become successful doing it your way. But uh, and even more importantly, communicating very good information. When Greg gave that stati statistic about uh, flat earthers and uh, millennials or the generation below, it, I couldn't help but think of individuals like Alex Jones when it comes to the news or the natural now distrust of mainstream media and other things and how the truth in ways is being subverted online across a variety of different mediums and different people. So to say you guys are fighting the good fight, I appreciate both of y'all. Um, I want to thank everyone for listening to this super long episode. I don't know if it's going to be one or two parts. You'll know by the end of this one whether it was one or two parts. If you want to help us out, the Iron Culture Podcast, which I was just informed, will shortly be taken over, and Jeff's going to start his own one. And ask if you want to subscribe to Applications and Strength Sports um, coming up soon. You can help us out, this fledgling podcast, by leaving a rating and review on iTunes. It does help us out. On YouTube, If feel free to leave a comment we try and respond we're back every single monday with a new episode the iron culture podcast we'll see you next time